We're in a message series called Put Em Up, Winning Your Spiritual Battles, and the title of today's message is Garden Variety, Spiritual Warfare. And um, you live in a culture that tells you that all spirituality is good, but the Bible will tell you otherwise, that much of that which is spiritual is actually demonic and evil and dark and dangerous. And just as there are good and bad people humans on the earth, there are good and bad spirits at work on the earth. Um, There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He made the earth and everything in it, every planet, all of the universe. He made beings, human beings, created a little lower than the angels. And there was a rebellion in heaven. And one-third of the angels lost the battle. They followed a, uh, a, a lead angel by the name of Lucifer, Satan. The, the Old Testament books of Ezekiel and Isaiah talk about this. Uh, Satan, Lucifer, did not want to worship God, did not want to be with God. He wanted to be God. And pride led to his downfall. Satan is a created being. He is not equal with God. He's not all-powerful, and he's not all-knowing. He's an angel who fell from heaven due to pride. Demons are very, very real, and they are angelic beings who sinned against God and were cast down as well. And for some reason I cannot fully explain, they have limited power here on earth for a time. But it is only for a time. Satan and his army, in fact, the Bible tells us more about his destination than about his origin. It talks about hell being a place prepared for the devil and his angels. In the meantime, though, when he has a measure of ability, his agenda is actually destruction. Jesus says he comes to steal and kill and destroy, and he will not lose one moment's sleep over wrecking you or your family. And actually, one of his chief weapons is lies. And this surprises a lot of people (laughs) because they often think of spiritual warfare as only being about power encounters. And next week, we'll talk about power encounters. But let me put something up here on, on the screen, which is that spiritual battles can be power encounters. But spiritual battles can can also be truth encounters. And I really want to underscore this point uh, this week, truth encounters. In fact, Jesus said, uh, here's a scripture I even read last week, John chapter 8. Satan was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Here's what you have to be. You have to become a master discerner, discerning what's true from what's false. Have you paid attention to how much the New Testament talks about false teaching, false doctrines? And it calls them doctrines of demons. In other words, absolutely demonically inspired false teachings designed to minimize Jesus and maximize you. And appeal to your pride. Satan is a master of deception. Okay? That's who he is. He's a master of deception. And let's read about the first encounter of uh, Satan in the Bible from Genesis chapter 3. Here we go. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, let me stop there for a moment. Um, You you must know that uh, this is before the serpent was judged. (laughs) And so, at this point, what did he look like? He didn't look like a, a, a scary snake. In fact, I believe he was a beautiful creature. The word literally means shining one. But here comes this little uh, exaggeration, if you will. 
did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Hey, question. For those of you who remember Genesis chapter 2, what God actually said, did God tell Adam and Eve they could not eat from any tree in the Garden of Eden? Answer? Shake your head like this. No. It's not what he said. He said, you may eat from every tree except one. Except one. But notice what Satan loves to do. He wants you to think that any restriction is oppression. Any restriction at all is, uh, you know, you're being so oppressed. And what's God thinking here? All of you who are parents have heard a child at some point say to you, you never let me do anything. And that's not true. You've given them so many gifts and opportunities, so much good they can do. But you do have a few restrictions. I'm sorry, you cannot have a charcoal grill in your bedroom. Sorry. You know. There, yeah, we, we have a few restrictions here. But say, oh, did God really say, you know, any restriction, any, you know, prohibition on your freedom is total prohibition on your freedom? That's not what he said. He exaggerates. Exaggerations are lies. Let me just remind you, don't believe lies and don't tell lies. And if you're an exaggerator, be very, very careful. You can make your point without exaggerating. If you have to exaggerate to make your point, you don't have a point. Verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, hey, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Did God actually tell them they couldn't touch it? Shake your head like this. No, oh, he didn't. Eve adds a little phrase here, making God more restrictive than he was. One old theologian said it like this, as soon as we start adding to the words of God, in essence, we're taking away from God's intent. So, starts, there's exaggeration, and now fabrication, just an outright lie. Verse 4, Satan says, you will not certainly die. God said, you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll die. And Satan says, you can believe him or you can believe me. Because I'm telling you, you will not certainly die. And you know what? You got to actually do what Satan tells you to find out whether or not he's telling you the truth. And when Adam and Eve take a bite of whatever piece of fruit that was, and by the way, you know, the Bible doesn't say that it's an apple. Could have been, I don't know. Um, they didn't just immediately die physically, right? I mean, Adam lived to be 900 and something years old. But the death process started and their relationship with God changed you will not certainly die. And isn't it interesting, this is the first doctrine in the Bible that is denied and countered by Satan. It's the doctrine of judgment. There's no judgment. You can disregard God. Everybody ends up in the same place in the end. You can disregard. You're not going to die. There are no consequences whatsoever. And I would say to you, be very, very careful of any propaganda campaign that advertises cost-free rejection of the Lord. And then there's insinuation, there's exaggeration, then there's just outright fabrication. God said, if you do this, you'll die. I'm telling you, you will not die. There is no, you don't need to worry about it. Cost-free disobedience. And then there's insinuation here. Notice what he's doing, verse 5. For God knows <laughs> that when you eat from this, 
your eyes are going to be opened. You're going to be like God, knowing good from evil. You see, God's a meanie. God's a big bully. And God's trying to keep you down and hold you down. He doesn't want you being like him. You need to make up your own mind. Who says God gets to decide what's good and what's evil? You decide. You just listen to the voice in your own head. Listen to the voice in your own heart. Listen to what other people say around you. And he calls God a liar, and he calls him a bully, and he goes after their sense of trust. Can you really trust that God wants what's best for you, or is God trying to keep the really good stuff from you? Well, that leads to a decision. What will Adam and Eve do? Verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Again, the issue is not the fruit. The fruit is the opportunity to either to demonstrate either faith, I'm going to honor what God has told me, or unbelief. So they did. It looked good. I'm sure it tasted good. It was appealing. And they listened to the tempter. And then, verse 7, the eyes of both of them were opened. You think, well, that's a good thing, right? No. Spiritually speaking, there's a certain thing as ignorance is bliss. And let me just appeal to many of you there are many things in this world you do not want to have an experience of. Somebody says, well, don't knock it till you try it. You need to have that experience just once. How will you know how to relate to others if you don't, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? You don't want to go there. There are certain things you don't want the experience of. You need to be able to trust that the Lord, when the Lord says, Here's a boundary. Here's a restriction. This is not good for you. You are my good, good father, and I'm going to listen to your counsel. Their eyes were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together, and they made coverings for themselves. And then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid themselves from the Lord God. God, who had been the creator, who had provided so much good for them, a wonderful environment, had been so close. Satan said, oh, you could, if you disobey God, you'll be more like him, when in reality, they couldn't have been any more like him. They had such an intimate relationship with the Lord, and they gave it away. And the Lord God walks. He wants to know where they are, and they're hiding Okay. I think one of the most underrated lyricists in rock and roll is Bob Seger. You know who Bob Seger is? Shake your head like this. You know who Bob Seger is. That's right. He has a song from years ago called Against the Wind. It has a great line in it. Here's the line. I wish I didn't know now what I didn't know then. Every single one of us in this room, all of you watching online, we could all say that. I wish I didn't know now what I didn't know then. I wish I'd been smarter, wiser, stronger, listened, whatever. There are power encounters and there are truth encounters. And we have to become wise decision makers. And here's the thing. God gives us his truth. Ten commandments. By the way, somebody, I read somebody say recently, they said really in our culture today, there's really only one commandment. As long as you're not a mass murderer, all the rest of them are, are, are fine. Right? That's not true. 
your Ten Commandments. And then there's the message of Jesus Christ. And so we become master decision makers and discerners. Dallas Willard said this, When Satan undertook to draw Eve away from God, he did not hit her with a stick, but with an idea. It was with an idea that God could not be trusted and that she must act on her own to secure her own well-being. Ignatius of Loyola is credited with this statement. Sin is the unwillingness to trust that what God wants for me is only my deepest happiness. It's what God does want for you. Well, so here's the story of what's commonly called the fall. Um, and we still live <laughs> under the implications of the fall. But there's a story of grace here in Genesis 3 that often gets overlooked. So Adam and Eve sin, they've fallen. There are consequences that come to Adam and Eve. There are consequences that are on your shoulders and my shoulders to this day as a result of that. For many of you, when you first meet Adam and Eve in heaven, one of your first questions is going to be, what were you thinking? And we still live with the consequences of that, if you believe the Bible, and I do. But if you come down to verse 21... There's an interesting statement here, and it's actually a foreshadowing of what will happen in Christ. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Look at that. Adam and Eve had their eyes opened. Now they're what? They're ashamed. They were with one another, great music playing in the background. Everything is natural. And now they are keenly aware of their fallenness and, and their brokenness. And God looks for them. And what do they do? They know they've disobeyed. And now they just want to hide shame and hiddenness is coming to their psyche. Their eyes have been opened. I sure wish I didn't know now what I didn't know then. But God has clothed them. How did he get these garments of skin? Answer, some innocent animal provided it. Or a couple of innocent animals. And an innocent animal had to be sacrificed, a shedding of blood, if you will, for Adam and Eve to be clothed. Is that not a picture of what Jesus Christ does for us as on the cross he will take as an innocent sacrifice my guilt and yours. And in turn, we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Satan's a master deceiver. And once you've listened to his temptations, listen carefully, he's going to throw out one accusation at you after another. You'll never measure up. You don't really belong. God can't use you. You think God's going to overlook that. And sometimes our own good, sensitive hearts will condemn us. The book of 1 John says sometimes our hearts condemn us. We can be our own worst critic. But sometimes there can also come just demonic accusation, which is typically just this general approach. And we have to respond with it in truth. Because listen to me carefully. While accusation can be very real, there's Holy Spirit conviction, that, and the Holy Spirit will try to get your attention on something very, very specific, and it's designed not to weigh you down, but to turn you home in grace and renewal and new opportunities. But you can't listen to the lies of the evil one that you'll never measure up, you're not going to be forgiven. You're a second-class citizen in the kingdom. Who do you think you are? Do you really believe? If those people actually knew what you thought, what you did, what had happened, you think they would ever look at you the same way? You think they would think you belong? 
And some of you today need to listen afresh to the master's invitation. Not to a master deceiver, but to the master Jesus and his invitation. You know, earlier today, we took communion. Isn't it interesting how (laughs) the very first temptation was in essence, hey, take and eat. Why don't you listen to these words from Jesus in a fresh way? And while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. The deception to take and eat has been reversed. The master gives you an invitation to renewal and grace. There's a counter strike. And then he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. (laughs) I don't want you stumbling and falling, but we are. We're going to aim high, we're going to seek to honor the Lord. But we regularly need forgiveness and renewal. Here's what cannot happen. If and when you stumble and you listen to temptation and you fall, what you cannot do is give in to that double whammy of keeping you down under the thumb of oppressive accusation. The book of 1 John is written to remind us that as Christians, we sin, we don't want to sin. We're not trying to sin. Sometimes we do, but <laughs> we, we, we actually want to serve the Lord and honor Him. And how do, once we get to heaven, we get white robes. We no longer have a fallen nature. We no longer deal with the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life. But until then, we're in a fight. And sometimes we make progress and sometimes we stumble. And 1 John 1 says this, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If there's ever a believer who says, you know, I kind of, I've, I've reached that threshold, <laughs> I've reached that level, no more sin in me, it's just not true. Now here's what a lot of people will do, they'll redefine sin. Let's redefine Lying's no longer a sin. The gossip's no longer a sin. So, you know, we can redefine it. But if you, don't, if you continue to allow God to define right and wrong, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But listen to this. But if we confess ourselves, and the word confess there is in the Greek tense of an ongoing way. In other words, I'm going to need to regularly be in the habit of confessing. Just like in taking the Lord's Supper, he says you do this as often as you come together while you're in the regular habit of being reminded of the grace and renewing power of Christ. If we confess our sins, to confess means I'm going to say the same thing. I'm going to agree with God that what I did there was amiss, what I did there was wrong, and I need to acknowledge it and seek to do better and turn from it. And if we confess our sins, notice, God's faithful. I may not have been, but He is faithful, and He is just, and He will forgive our sins, and He will purify us 
Notice this wonderful little big word coming up. All unrighteousness. Forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And you say, well, I'm sure God gets tired of me coming back. No. You keep coming back. You keep coming back. Don't you give in to the double whammy of getting down under accusation. You confess. You repent. Take advantage of, of resources around you, brothers and sisters, to help and support. Don't do it all on your own. But don't you listen to the lie that you don't belong in Christ. You don't have a place of service. There's no longer any kingdom benefit for you. That's just not true. Let me sort of summarize what I've tried to say this morning. God made our very first parents, Adam and Eve, and we are descendants of them. And the first Adam failed. The Bible talks about a first Adam and a second Adam. The first Adam failed. And uh, we, we bear in our own flesh, by nature and by choice, a propensity to do wrong and a pr propensity to be foolish to just absolutely be foolish. And we need to listen to God and be like smart sheep, not foolish sheep, and listen to God. Um, Adam and Eve could not blame their wrongdoing on their environment. They had a great environment. Just like I can't blame my goofiness on my environment. I've been my own worst enemy, and you've been your own worst enemy. I need, a, I need a Savior and I need a shepherd. And what happened is God in His great love, just like He did in the garden for Adam and Eve, went looking for them. He's come looking for us. The first Adam failed, but the second Adam, Jesus Christ, succeeded. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, comes to earth. And the Bible says, don't, don't skim over this. He was tempted in every way like we are, yet without sin. And so this Jesus ultimately is murdered unjustly, goes to the cross, and Satan and his demonic army thought they had won a great victory, targeting the Lamb of God. But on that cross, Jesus Christ has done something absolutely extraordinary. He's taken your sin and mine upon himself. He's paid the penalty for our sin as a substitute, and he's qualified to do it. He's a perfect, innocent substitute. And in that moment, the Bible says, he actually used Satan's purposes against him. What he meant for evil Jesus Christ took and worked it for good. And in the scripture I read last week, actually on the cross won a great victory, not just a great victory that, in fact, if you were standing there at the cross, you would have thought Jesus had lost. When in reality, in all the angelic and spiritual realm, there was great celebration and worship and praise for what Jesus Christ has done. He's actually won not lost, he goes to the cross signifying and earning for you and me what we could never earn for ourselves. And on that day, we've never been more loved as the righteous anger of God poured out on Christ and his perfection can now be available to us and a great victory was won that day. When Jesus said, it is finished, it was not the cry of someone who was a victim. It was the declaration of someone who was a victor saying, this is a triumphant victory. And three days later, Jesus rose from the grave signifying, this is of God. This sacrifice is acceptable. Have you been to Dallas lately? I was in Dallas at a basketball tournament the last two or three days. 
you realize it's been 80 degrees here and 40 degrees in Dallas over the last three days? I realize that. I was there. And uh, I, I choose 80 anytime over, over 40. But so driving back and forth between Dallas, you, you do know we have two buckies on I-45. And, you know, it's been a while since I've been in a Bucky's. It's a lot of fun to go in Bucky's. 99 cents for a jumbo soft drink. Anything you want in Bucky's. We didn't really need to stop, but we stopped. I mean, you, know, you got to stop at both. You can't just stop at one. You got to stop at both Bucky's between here and, uh, and, and Dallas. Um, they had a, a section for clothes. Who knew you could buy clothes in Bucky's? And uh, they had a section for clothes and a section of T-shirts. And they had an Easter section of T-shirts. Here was our favorite. It said this, a lot can happen in three days. A lot can and a lot did. Don't you ever listen to a lie that says you're a loser. You're only a loser if you run away from Jesus Christ. You hang on. You love him. You serve him. And just like the Lord said, where are you? I'm asking you today, where are you? Are you a friend of God or are you an enemy of God? Are you running to Christ or are you running away from Christ? Run to him in fresh humility, confession, and repentance. All right, we want to uh, take some time to pray and sing. Worship team, please be taking your places uh, back up here. And as they're making their way, I want to read a scripture here from James chapter 4. And uh, this is a I'm going to read it from the, the message translation. And this is a section of Scripture that's written to believers who had become a little complacent, worldly, ambivalent about their faith. Here's what it says. He says, so you need to let God work his will in you. Yell a loud no to the devil, and you watch him make himself scarce. But you say a quiet yes to God, and he'll be there in no time. Quit dabbling in sin. Purify your inner life. Quit playing the field. Hit bottom. Cry your eyes out if you need to. The fun and games are over. Get serious, really serious. And you get down on your knees before the master because it's the only way then you get back up on your feet. God bless you, everybody. Remember who you are and to whom you belong. You be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power and in his great truth.